So I think now Pratik will take over. Uh, good evening, everyone. Today we have with us our guest of honor, Padma Bhushan Awardee, Dr. Arvind Panagriya sir, respected director, Dr. Manoj K. Tiwari sir, Dean Student Affairs, Dr. Hema Date ma'am, esteemed guests and invitees, honorable faculty members, officers and staff of NITI, and my dear friends. It is with much pride and elation that I welcome you all to the last lecture, an integral part of Rena Leadership Talk series. At a time when students are entering the post-COVID era, stepping into the challenging corporate atmosphere with their summer internships and jobs ahead, the last lecture brings inspiring life stories and experiences of renowned personalities to aid students in making a transition to corporate and understanding the business environment at large. The theme of today's session is India onwards and beyond with our distinguished guest, Dr. Arvind Panagariya sir, who is currently a professor of economics at Columbia University. Dr. Panagariya is a Padma Bhushan awardee, the first vice chairman of Niti Aayog and a former chief economist of Asian Development Bank. We thank him for gracing us with his presence today. The National Institute of Ing Industrial Engineering was established in the year 1963 by the government of India and the United Nations International Labour Organization. The endeavor was to create a center of excellence that would generate solutions to the problems of an aggressively expanding industrial sector and to upskill the next generation of techno managers. I would now request our respected director, Dr. Manoj K. Tiwari, sir, to welcome our esteemed guest. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. Thank you, Dr.
uh, already I have uh, given my one welcome to sir. So now I think uh, you can start the process. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Director Sir, uh, for introducing the esteemed guest with your kind words. I would now request uh, Professor K. Sanjini Ma'am to kindly moderate the session with Dr. Arvind Banana. Thank you, Pratik. It's an honor to be here, sir, in the presence of such illustrious people. Uh, Niti is forever grateful for the wonderful uh, insights that we are about to hear from you. Um, we have had about um, eight to nine months of extremely trying times when we were forced to innovate, we were forced to do things very, very differently. So we have delivered lectures online, we have heard lectures online. Our students have almost, you know, delivered projects online and uh, we are already moving into a hybrid mode. So the, the next set of students are already training themselves to be partly online and partly offline. So it, in a very short span of time, I think this is probably one of the nine months that the world has witnessed where we've just, we've, we've dealt with too many disruptions. And uh, I'm sure that India has been a surprise story in terms of the way we uh, handled the pandemic. And uh, also, probably, we are being spoken about in terms of our solutions post-corona um, and also in terms of the vaccination. And uh, probably in several other contexts, because we are known for disruptive innovations. I think we've really upped the game uh, in that context. Uh, so when we look at somebody like you who's uh, who's had a really wide spectrum of experience delivering policies uh, somebody who's whose thought process is probably superior to most of what we usually are used to uh, we uh, would like to first welcome you uh, to this session uh, hear from you some of uh, your interesting uh, tidbits from your interesting journey especially uh, in terms of your experience in Niti Aayog, your experience in policy. And uh, later, we will follow it up with a um, lot of questions. Students have come up with many, many questions. But uh, I think to begin the session, uh, I think uh, the context is naturally that of a very, very progressive nation. Uh, so we would like to hear your views, probably a few stories, a little bit of tidbits, a little bit of experiences of yours uh, uh, in, in your Niti Aayog time. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Professor Anjani. Thank you, uh, Professor Tiwari. Uh, and uh, thank you, Pratik, uh, uh, Professor Hemadate, uh, other faculty and students. Uh, all right. So I've been asked to speak about my life. Um, and uh, that's not something that I uh, often do. I, I probably never done it. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, Professor Tiwari said something about, you know, say something about your exciting life. Uh, I should say that, you know, in the life of an academic, there is not uh, uh, a whole lot of exciting, thing, exciting things. Uh, I mean, they can be exciting to me, but they may not really make exciting stories. Uh, but uh, just as by way of background, let me say that, you know, this past summer, uh, I thought I'll, you know, because particularly of my experience at the Niti Aayog, I thought I'll write my autobiography. So I started it and I uh, 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 was quite aware that, you know, the, the life of my father uh, 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 had been far more exciting. So, so I started with that, you know, my grandmother and, and father, I thought I'll write one chapter each. But as I wrote that, I found that that life was so much more interesting than my own. So I actually ended up writing a biography of my father, uh, which uh, uh, HarperCollins will now be publishing uh, in, in a few months. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it's really, you know, uh, we are what, what uh, uh, our, our uh, uh, predecessors make us. Uh, and, and that certainly is very much true of my own life. Uh, uh, and, and just uh, to, to, to tell you how uh, uh, interesting my father's life was, you know, uh, he, when he was born, he was born in a village. And, and uh, uh, by the time he was born, the family had fallen into abject poverty. 
uh, to the point of you know uh, not being able to afford even two meals a day uh, and at five he lost his father uh, and uh, his mother who was very young at the time obviously uh, uh, you know she couldn't have been more than maybe you know uh, 21 22 years old um, uh, the the responsibility fell on her and uh, he she used to then you know uh, do this charkha and and would would uh, 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 with with that uh, suit that that she produced, you know, she would earn two annas a day, uh, and on that she tried to 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 get my father educated. You know, there was no school. A school teacher came in, and he sort of would charge one rupee a month or something. So that's the sort of life, you know, and uh, that that my father had. And and uh, later on, when he visited me in the 1980s uh, uh, in the United States. I was giving him a round of, of the east coast of the United States and, and I, uh, uh, as we were passing the White House uh, one time in the car, uh, he said, oh, you know, great, with great admiration that, you know, or, or how about, you know, you really have made it from the capital of the state of Rajasthan. We come from Jaipur uh, 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 to, to, to Washington, D.C., the, the, the capital of the world. So, so my reaction to him was that, well, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the journey of uh, yours from the village of Sohana to Jaipur was far more uh, difficult one. And once you had completed that journey, it was quite easy for me. You know, my journey from Jaipur to Washington, D.C. was really nothing. And so uh, in any case, so, uh, you know, when we grew up, uh, the, the, there were not too many opportunities, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, economy. The, the, the the country had become independent economic development had just begun uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know the bulk of the population was still uh, in rural areas agriculture it still is actually two thirds of india still in rural areas um, uh, but but moreover in the urban india also there were not that many opportunities uh, and so you know anything the only decent thing uh, that if you uh, uh, were lucky enough to to uh, uh, you know, have had some education uh, that you would aspire to uh, was, uh, uh, you know, the Indian Administrative Services. Uh, and my father had been in administration. Uh, and uh, I had two other brothers. So one was already marked to become a doctor, another to become an engineer. So it fell upon me to become the administrator. Uh, and that's what, you know, uh, he was grooming me for. Uh, and, and it so happened that, you know, when I completed my master's, uh, uh, I was still one year short. Uh, we used to have a minimum age uh, for uh, 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 the IAS. You had to be 21 uh, years of uh, age uh, in the month of August or something, the year that you were going to take the exam. And I was a couple of months short. So I became a lecturer at Rajasthan University. And then, you know, just imitating my older brother, I started applying to the universities abroad uh, uh, and there was no seriousness uh, that I would go abroad because, you know, uh, we, uh, our lives were very shaped by the father uh, who was always very influential and he was very clear in his mind that I ought to take the Indian Administrative Services exam. Uh, but uh, I did that, I got into three universities, Chicago, Cornell and Princeton. Uh, 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 and lo and behold, Princeton gave a fellowship, <laughs> so, which was all uh, inexplicable. Uh, it remains inexplicable to me till today uh, why I got it, because, you know, I was from the Rajasthan University. Who would know at Princeton anything about Rajasthan University for that matter? Uh, but anyway, so I was cast, uh, uh, contrary to my father's wishes and advice, uh, 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 in the end, I was uh, uh, forceful enough that he conceded and I went to Princeton and that's how, you know. So there are a few things that, that happen in life which uh, uh, which you didn't anticipate and the course of your life is changed. Um, and uh, so I, then I did my PhD at Princeton, uh, specialized in international trade and all, uh, and uh, took up an academic job. I had uh, the option to go to the World Bank at the time, but uh, at that time I chose the riskier paths. Uh, because, you know, the success in, in uh, the U.S. academic world is not a foregone conclusion. Uh, the tenure process is incredibly tough. Uh, 
uh, but luckily everything worked out. I sort of, you know, uh, some eight or 10 years later, I then went in and spent four years at the World Bank. I started out as a theorist. So much of my, you know, uh, uh, academic work, uh, uh, at least the very early one, which, which helped me win my tenure, uh, was, was on trade theory. And this is also the period during which I came into very close contact with India's foremost trade theorist, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati. And he really became a very major influence on me, both academically and otherwise. We became very good friends and colleagues eventually. Um, so uh, uh, that, then I went to the World Bank on leave for four years. Uh, and that kind of reshaped my career a bit further. Uh, because uh, those four years, then I began to transition into policy. Uh, uh, and at that time, I thought that I would write a book on India and all. But then there was somebody else at the World Bank who had written something which I saw was pretty thick manuscript, which he never actually brought out. But I thought, you know, he had already done it, what I'd, I had in mind. So I, I didn't write anything on India at the time. Uh, but uh, it did change me, you know, I began to, 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 to write a lot more on policy, first on trade policy. Uh, and eventually, you know, then the Asian Development Bank happened in 2001. Uh, 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 I spent some time there, uh, returned, and then I came to Colombia. This was a chair also named, uh, 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 that, 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 that was created in the name of Jagdish Bhagwati. So it's called the Bhagwati Professorship in Indian Political Economy. Uh, so this this was explicitly actually Indian political economy, and so it it, it it gave me the chance to then return to what I wanted to do, which which was to write the book, and that's where I wrote that book, India: The Emerging Giant, um, the first major book, and and uh, uh, it, it uh, turned out to be very successful. It was very well received, reviewed uh, very extensively, uh, both in India and outside. Um, uh, so there, and then uh, you know. In the meantime, I'd begun to write in the media, uh, 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 and that was thanks to uh, Swami Nathan Iyer, uh, who happened to be visiting here at the time, and we came in touch, and he said, you know, why don't you write for the Economic Times once a week? <laughs> so I said, let me think back, and I called him back a week later, said, you know, once a week, I just cannot do it, but can I do it once a month? So he said, yeah, yeah, you know, choose your pace. And so I started writing. and. So I, I started this in 1999, I think, and uh, I've continued. Uh, uh, that, that turned out to be something uh, of, of a very useful activity. It is not an activity for which the academics get much credit from their peers. Uh, you know, it, it, it's it's uh, uh, from that perspective, it, it is uh, it takes away your time actually, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, this is an activity that that it does not bring you. Uh, uh, any benefits in your academic career, but I found it to be actually extremely useful, um, many different ways. But most importantly, I think you know gradually. I also, I mean, initially when you start, you you know just uh, uh, are very pleased to see your name in 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 the newspapers. Uh, but eventually, I think you know this for me became a very uh, effective instrument of conveying difficult economic ideas to a wider audience. Uh, uh, th this is not something that is innovative, but innovation largely is in conveying difficult ideas in a sort of relatively rigorous manner, but uh, without jargon. Uh, it, it, it is an art you have to learn, uh, and which I did over, over the years. Uh, and, and that gradually I found was, 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 was had, had a very large payoff. Um, uh, uh, and, and I really feel that, you know, academics, particularly in social sciences, uh, should feel some obligation actually to do that. Uh, that it is it is not just uh, uh, you know sciences are a little different. That you know largely most of what you do remains uh, in in the sandbox uh, uh, where you are uh, with your other peers and other colleagues. But social sciences are a little different. Uh, and we we ought to actually convey the ideas to to wider audience, engage with others and so forth as well. Uh, and it was that engagement eventually, you know, landed me at the Niti Ayo. Uh, uh, that is a whole different story. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I came in contact with Prime Minister uh, when he was Chief Minister in Gujarat, uh, largely because I'd written some columns uh, on Gujarat. 
uh, which uh, uh, happened to be very influential at that time. You know, uh, uh, and, and I wrote those columns purely by accident. There is a lot of debate that is going on around 2012. This was during the Gujarat elections, uh, uh, state elections, uh, and uh, I had a conversation with somebody, and so I was doing a large two million dollar project, actually funded by the Templeton Foundation. Uh, as a part of which we were also studying Gujarat. And it was very clear to me that Gujarat under Mr. Modi had done uh, incredibly well. And this debate was really very contentious, you know, also uh, making all kinds of negative claims, which had no real foundation to me. Uh, so, uh, so I happened to then write, you know, based on serious research, what we had seen, all the data and so forth. It spoke very well, actually, of the Gujarat experience, whether it was growth, whether it was poverty, alleviation, uh, almost uh, all dimensions, you know. So I wrote those. That really got the, the, the attention of the, 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 the chief minister, now the prime minister. And that is how it all began. Uh, uh, then when he formed the Niti Aayog, uh, uh, he asked me to, to come in and, and uh, be the first vice chairman. Uh, that was a challenge. That was truly a serious challenge. Uh, and I was very nervous. Uh, you know, throughout my life, what I've been, you know, there are two types of people. One, those who push for themselves. And then there are others who sort of don't push, but when an opportunity comes, they take it. I fall in the second category. So I rarely push for anything myself, you know, I never seek. I've, uh, and that sort of comes from my father. He never did that. And, and perhaps, you know, you learn, uh, even though that's not what he taught me, but uh, that's, how, that's what you learn. Uh, and uh, uh, so when the opportunity came, I took it. Uh, it, it, it in many dimensions, it was very challenging, not the least because, you know, our children were here in the United States. Uh, uh, I'd lived, you know, by that time for 40 years in the United States, uh, even going back living and so forth, you know. So, there were these challenges involved, but uh, I felt that this was a challenge one uh, had to take. Uh, I came and, and uh, even to some people uh, who had served in very senior positions told me that, you know, uh, <laughs> in many senior positions in, in India uh, told me that it's a real challenge, uh, which did not <laughs> do uh, uh, very much to assuage my own fears. Um, but you take the plunge, uh, uh, and uh, I gradually learn. I'm a fast learner, so I gradually learn. Uh, one very good thing about this position was that it uh, uh, comes with the rank of the cabinet minister. And that actually within the Indian hierarchical system does put you at the apex. And in the end, you know, th there is a power that comes with it uh, within the system. Uh, and I gradually learned that, uh, <laughs> the, the power of that power. Uh, and, and, and use that uh, to, to push the new things, new initiatives and so forth. Uh, uh, now, you know, the other thing I, I learned, you know, very early in my tenure, uh, that one of the very senior officers from Niti came in and said, okay, sir, you are too uh, uh, humble and, and you shouldn't do that. The officers are badmash about, you know, they will. Uh, so I said, look, you know, don't worry. Uh, humility does get uh, mistaken for weakness uh, uh, initially, uh, but they will quickly learn that I'm, uh, 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 I'm not a weak person. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, uh, and sometimes in the reverse, you know, arrogance is taken, mistaken for confidence. Uh, <laughs> that is also a mistaken notion. And some people do try to get away actually by being arrogant to, to establish their uh, ability to be very confident, which eventually gets exposed. So in any case, uh, uh, I, I, I was a different kind of head of the institution. Uh, and I sort of, you know, uh, uh, and, and we, uh, uh, the, the, the big, the main issue always, I think in this, I found out in everything that you do is to get a good team. Uh, you can do only as well as your team is, uh, or as, as good as, as your team is. Uh, and and uh, I think, you know, we were able to accomplish a number of things. I'll not talk about, you know, what, what, what we did and so forth. Uh, uh, and uh, that was the stint. And uh, three years later, actually, you know, roughly I spent two, two months and eight, uh, two years and eight months. 
and that my leave at Columbia ended at that time. And so I sort of returned. So I'm back to, uh, to doing the, uh, what I used to do, but much more now, you know, uh, my research has pretty much writings largely have become very policy. I hardly do any theory. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I think they are also focused a lot more now on India than on trade. So that's, that's my, my life story. If I were to tell you, you know, uh, uh, for the students particularly, uh, now going out uh, into the world, uh, work hard. I think, you know, for success, there is no shortcut. Uh, you need intelligence, which all of you do have, you know, by virtue of being at the institution. Uh, but uh, that's just not enough. You know, uh, you'll not find anybody who succeeded truly without very serious hard work. You know, you have to be hardworking, you have to be persistent, you have to take the opportunities and challenges when they come. Uh, but above all, I think, you know, you should also maintain your integrity. I think that's something my father got from, from my grandmother and I got it from my father. Uh, uh, and. Uh, you know, you sleep very well, uh, uh, and and also, you know, if you are if, if, if you are uh, trying to move fast, you know, through through means that are that are not fair means. Uh, in the end, it doesn't pay off. In the longer run, uh, being truthful, I think, works out a lot better than relying on falsehood because uh, truth is a little hard to tell initially. But once you have said the truth, even in a difficult situation, the rest of it, it gets much easier. Uh, but you know, if you start out with that lie, then to hide that lie, you have to keep following, you know, and, and uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you know, I'll become very quickly inconsistent <laughs> because I would not be able to keep track of what I said, which was, you know, so if you told truth, then you know, there is only one thing to tell and this is what you tell. Uh, so, so generally, I think that I personally, in my life, found that to be to be a, 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 a very important and useful virtue to have. I mean, it's not just for you know uh, uh, telling others or anything, but but it is simply that in your own life, you will find that you know that that strategy turns out to be uh, uh, much uh, better for yourself personally uh, than than uh, uh, anything else. So that's roughly what I would say out of my life. Okay, I think you successfully threw us off the scent when you said that you had nothing interesting in your life. No, no, no. So I think we all would like to disagree and uh, we, we would have been so happy to hear a little bit more. Uh, most importantly, I think uh, somebody who's had the kind of success that you've had um, giving the message of humility, I think that's really going to sit very well with the students. I wish that they hear more of this and more often. Um, and I'm sure that uh, they will internalize this as they grow in their careers, as they become, as they try to become better human beings and contribute better for the nation. So I'll just um, quickly run through the question section because I'm probably getting... Um, on a daily basis, some questions because students are quite excited to be interacting with somebody like you. Um, the, the starting point of, I think uh, this concern is there among students. I think it's a concern among many of us that um, in a post COVID world where many major economies have taken a big hit uh, and we are almost seeing protectionism. Uh, so where do you think free trade stands in a world order like this? Okay, very good. That's a very good question to start with. First of all, you know, so um, take the world. Um, my take on this has always been that India really should not worry about what is going on in the world on trade. Some protectionism, protectionist sentiment has been there. Uh, and maybe it has risen a little bit with President Trump and China kind of fighting uh, over the markets. Uh, but what you need to recognize is that the global economy today is extremely, extremely large. 
global merchandise exports these are 2018 figures but they are good enough for us to 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 um, to, to take them or, or maybe these are 2019 19 and a half trillion dollars of exports merchandise exports plus five and a half trillion of commercial services exports together 25 trillion dollars now that's a very large export market china when it began to grow at a very rapid pace and particularly as as it began to export on a very large scale around you know late 1990s uh, uh, to 2000 uh, it was only merchandise exports was only six trillion services maybe another two trillion so it was very small today it is three to four times of that our problem is never going to be the size of the global market our problem is what size slice of that market we are able to carve for ourselves today in merchandise exports we have only 1.7 percent share in services maybe we have a closer to three percent below three but closer closer very low china's exports in merchandise exports has a share of something of the order of uh, uh, 13 percent now you know we'll never get to 13 uh, well uh, certainly not anywhere in the foreseeable future uh, but let's make that 1.7 into something like three percent three and a half percent that will go a long way so i think that is what we need to worry about uh, there ought to be our starting point now from that perspective what we are doing within the country becomes very important in the end uh, what happens to our exports uh, our share in the global marketplace therefore uh, very much depends on what we do. Now we are doing everything right right now, if you ask me. But there is one area in which we are going the wrong way, and that is our own trade policy. That is where we are actually raising our trade barriers. Uh, it's not like the 70s or 80s, of course, when everything was subject to import licensing, tariff rates were uh, on average 165 percent the highest tariff rate was 355 percent so it, it, it's not that kind of protectionism we are doing but we are gradually raising the, the tariff barriers you know our average tariff today maybe we store 12 13 percent although some tariffs are very very high the automobile is over 100 uh, percent uh, textiles is 25 percent more but but the, the the but the direction of policy is the reverse of what it needs to be so what we need to go, do is get back open up ourselves continue return uh, you know roll back the tariffs that we have raised not only that but we need to further lower our tariffs uh, you know our last tariff reductions major ones happened in 2007-8 when we you know the top tariff rate what we had done was you know we had started from the top and started kept comp compressing so from 100, uh, you know, 355 in the first go, we went to 110, and then we kept compressing. Although some tariff peaks were left out, you know, as I mentioned, automobile, textiles, etc. But we had brought by 2007-8 the top tariff rate to 10%, with some of these exceptions allowed. Um, now we are going back, and and what we need to do is return to more liberal markets that's what we need to do yeah so i think you are advocating that we need to open up uh, and go back to our free trading base um so um, since you spoke about the market we have a related question we are kind of now seeing the cycle turn uh, from nationalization to today an official policy of privatization in as much as it got announced in the budget also. So um, how do you see this going? Are you envisaging a successful uh, privatization drive or are you seeing it, uh, you know, a road ridden with potholes and probably we go one step forward but two steps back. So how do you view this privatization? So I, I hope we go two steps forward and one step back, not two back and one forward. 
<laughs> that way. So, uh, but but you, you 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 know the skepticism you sort of that underlies the question is is uh, not without justification. Now, actually, under Prime Minister Modi, I was the one who started this process initially. Uh, early in 2016, you know, we sought the mandate at Niti Aayog that we ought to move on both the fronts, meaning closure of many sick units, uh, which were doing nothing, uh, but they were not being closed down. And so there is always this demand for restructuring of these units, uh, as well as uh, fire sales, you know, meaning uh, outright privatization of, uh, private, uh, of, uh, of public sector enterprises. Uh, Prime Minister gave us the mandate uh, and we worked and we, you know, basically the mandate was to prepare a list and prepare a roadmap of how uh, each of these units ought to be privatized. There are different ways to privatize and so in each case we were supposed to make a recommendation on uh, how this particular enterprise ought to be privatized. We uh, moved very quickly uh, and October 2016 actually the first list was approved by the cabinet. And then subsequently, a number of other lists were approved. So, so easily, you know, uh, more than two dozen uh, um, enterprises already have an approval. Before I left Niti Aayog, I also wrote the first report on the privatization of Air India. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, you see the outcome: not a single enterprise has been privatized. So, the the skepticism underlying your question is very well taken. Uh, I still hold my optimism, so uh, you know uh, uh, that that and and without uh, optimism, you know, uh, I mentioned for for writing on policy in in uh, in in in, uh, in in the media, etc. We get no uh, no uh, uh, brownie points in in our academic life, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, so so you have to be true believer that things can happen. That you can make a difference <laughs> to, to 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 do that. So you need optimism for for that purpose. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I, I I think things are moving. Uh, you know the very fact that the government actually officially announces a policy, and this is also still not you know this is still they are still to complete their second year. And the government has not completed the second year. And after the announcement of the policy, if three years later, when the term actually ends, nothing has been done, I think the government will have difficult time answering itself. So I think this time something serious may happen. I should say that what has been outlined in the policy is uh, is 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 a, a, a very very uh, broad agenda for privatization. It's not uh, you know it it is transformational. So. Uh, and uh, for any of you who may have read my, you know, who have not read the, the latest piece that came out yesterday or day before yesterday in the Economic Times, uh, what I have said is that, you know, this is a multi-year agenda with every year packed with action is, is what it will require to, to actually implement in seriousness this policy. So I have said that, you know, th this, this requires a separate ministry. Uh, we, we need a separate privatization ministry whose charge should be and, and, and that ministry ought to be judged by how many privatizations it does actually every year. Uh, there are some which are easy ones, you know, low hanging fruits, which uh, they can do pretty rapidly because, you know, many of these enterprises are listed on the stock market. You know exactly what the stock price is. Uh, often this uh, the the uh, in many cases uh, the government owns only 60% of the equity so it's a matter of you know uh, 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 unloading 10 percentage points or more of those uh, shares uh, you fall below 50% then you can bring in a professional board uh, private board uh, to run the enterprises and the rest of it can be you know uh, uh, sold uh, uh, more gradually so there is no risk either for the officers, you know, who get worried about vigilance agencies coming after them. But if it's a listed thing and you say that, well, adopt a rule based and maybe necessary, if you feel necessary, get the clearance of the cabinet that, you know, you are starting from month such and such. Every month you are going to unload two percentage points of the equity. Uh, and in five months, 10 percent is unloaded uh, and uh, the thing can be then uh, given uh, to a private board. 
So, so that's the way it can be done. Uh, I think, uh, I, uh, I'm, as I said, you know, I'm optimistic that this, uh, uh, you know, it makes no sense for the government to announce a policy if they are not going to do it. Uh, and and I never doubted actually the sincerity of the government itself. I think that the roadblocks came at the bureaucratic level, uh, and which is why I I say appoint a separate ministry. So it's it's uh, very reassuring that you know somebody at uh, of your caliber is uh, so filled with optimism and you actually laid out a very neat roadmap in the last five minutes for the disinvestment. I do wish that this is exactly how things pan out. You were speaking about the market also. Um, a lot of young people um, that I met in the last six, seven months uh, have all um, surprisingly been very optimistic about the market and currently it's enjoying the face of the bull run. I am not actually asking for predictions, but I am just um, asking your view on. There are still some naysayers. They say that there is an overheated market and uh, and it's not a genuine run. So, so what is it that you think is really happening? So this is the question of a stock market, I suppose. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, you know, look, I, I'm not a stock market person myself, uh, and I've never. Uh, uh, on my own, uh, invested a penny in, in, in anything. So, uh, but this is what I would say uh, as an economist. Uh, I think uh, 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 Indian economy over the. So I take a longer, uh, longer term view of the market, uh, and so I think you know, eight to ten years more if necessary. Uh, over that kind of period, uh, Indian economy is going to be one of the ones with the highest returns. Uh, specifically, whether you will make the, those uh, highest returns or not depends on whether you make the right choices. I don't know that. If, if I knew that, then probably I would not be uh, wasting my time uh, lecturing. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, so, so that is up to, you know, that is on, on what choices you make. But uh, by and large, uh, uh, the highest returns, uh, you know, there's a good reason why I say so. Uh, among the major economies, India is the only economy left now, uh, uh, which uh, is still at a per capita income level of about $2,200 a year. China is roughly five times of that. And so the potential for India to grow 8 to 10% a year is greater than in any other major, I mean, I don't, I can't think of a major economy, right? You know, you, you've got economies in Latin America and in Africa and so forth. They're all smaller economies. Uh, uh, Brazil is the only one which is really large economy in, in Latin America of this kind of size. Uh, but uh, I don't expect Brazil to do very well. Uh, so I leave that out. That only leaves India. And uh, its potential for 8 to 10% growth is very much there. Uh, it has done all the right things. So, you know, even with current trade policy, I expect, you know, post-COVID decade, India to grow at 8% or more. Uh, if we do trade policy right also alongside, I think we'll get to 10. Uh, so those returns will have to come from somewhere. That growth will have to come from somewhere. Uh, and, and so uh, over a longer period of time, uh, uh, I have no doubt, uh, you know. And uh, in fact, even, you know, any, major companies that that you invest in you can have a diversified portfolio there uh, uh, over a long enough period five to ten years i think you will reap very high returns i have no doubt so i have a very interesting question here your books such as india and emerging giant and india unlimited reclaiming the lost glory and others are inspiringly optimistic about India's potential in being one of the largest economies of the world. So again, they're asking you, um, where is your source of optimism? And of course, I think students are looking at some kind of inspiration. So they would like to hear from you uh, a little bit more about this train of thought. Yeah, so, you know, look at our history. I think there is a reason in the history uh, in the economic history to be optimistic. Um, uh, first of all, when our policies were really bad, we did do very badly. 
uh, well, I, I the very badly, but we did badly. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, the initial model that we had adopted with very strict licensing on imports, on investment, very large public sector, um, very closed economy, we grew about three and a half percent. First three decades, you know, so this is when I said, talked about, you know, that there are not many opportunities in my time. That's precisely the problem that, uh, you know, last 10 years that I spent in India, you know, from let's say 1964 to 65 uh, to 74. I left India in 1974. There's no perceptible change in any living standards at all. You know, growth per capita incomes were growing at less than 1% a year during that during that, that decade. So that is how bad it was. Once we adopted good policies, we started growing very rapidly. Uh, I remember actually, you know, one of another of India's leading uh, um, economists, Shankar Acharya, uh, 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 I mean, he and I on, uh, agree on all policies, uh, and uh, but but we we often disagree about the growth rates that we predict. And in 2005, you know, he said India will by, by you know 2005 India was growing at eight percent plus already, and he was making the argument that this is purely a cycle effect, and will drop back to five or six. I was arguing that no, this is a change in shift in the trend has happened. And I proved my optimism proved right. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's not that, you know, he, uh, uh, I, I had a better sense of, you know, I think I, I, I greatly respect Shankar actually, you know, is one of the best uh, that I can think of on India. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, 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 my view was based on the fact that we have actually, and Prime Minister Atul Bihari Vajpayee, a large number of reforms have been introduced on top of what Prime Minister Narasimha Rao had already uh, done. And the payoff had to, was now being coming, which it did. And we grew for nine years, actually, about 8% 8, 8 plus, 8.2%. 8 2003, 4 to 11, 12, average growth rate of GDP in India was 8.2%. Uh, then we made policy mistakes, UPA too, and this effect happens with lag, by the way. So, which is why the growth actually, this 8% plus growth happened after Vajpayee actually had, uh, you know, his last year was already 8%, 7.9, uh, uh, but it happened at the, almost at the end of his term. But then it continued, in spite of the fact that UPA1 really didn't continue with the reforms. But then UPA2 actually started doing things that were anti-reform, anti-growth, anti-markets. Number of things they did, and for which we paid. You know, in the uh, uh, 12, 13, and 13, 14, growth fell below 6% on average. Uh, inflation became very high. Current account deficit became large. Inflation became so. Policy is matter. In the end, optimism is grounded in policy. Now, take the full period of 17 years. 2003, 4 to 2019, 20, just pre COVID, just before COVID, but at the end of COVID. I challenge you, none of you actually knows what the growth rate on average was during these 17 years. Most of you will say 6%, 5%. It was 7.4%. We have grown, and that's the highest for any democracy, let alone major democracy. You know, I'm just saying any democracy pickups. For a 17-year period to grow at 7.4%, that's the highest that has ever been done on record. And I still think that you know there's a lot more that we can uh, uh, we can do. And and some of the reforms related to labor laws, relating to insolvency bankruptcy code, uh, GST, corporate profit tax, a uh, number of uh, digitization of the systems. A uh, lot of these things, big infrastructure uh, building up and all, all of this is being done, is being done continuously today uh, uh, with, with great passion by the Prime Minister. Um, and, and so, you know, from 7.4, 7 we have already averaged. So uh, what does it take to get to 8, uh, 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 you know, with all the reforms that have been done, whose impact is yet to be felt? I mean, right now, actually, the last two years uh, before COVID, we suffered because of one big mistake that the Modi government did do, which was the financial sector. 
I, I think, you know, I mean, this non-performing assets, which was their inheritance. I think, you know, a lot of reckless lending was done during the second UPA. Among many mistakes they made, one, one was also about lending. A lot of reckless lending happened during that time. That a lot of the dishonest uh, uh, entrepreneurs gamed the system, uh, kept borrowing and restructuring. But the government was also lax in this. You know, why did they let it happen? Uh, but anyway, that all translated into this was clear to me in 2014, actually, which I had pointed out 2015 when I came to Niti Aayog. I again tried to raise very much that look. You know, we need to do it fast and all. But uh, uh, like all other countries, you know, NPAs, we don't, countries are very slow to react to NPAs and that India was no exception. And so financial sector went into big stress, which is what caused the growth rate. Uh, it spilled immediately. I mean, finance, money goes into, it's like water. It can seep in anywhere. Uh, and so when financial sector goes into a stress, you, you know, uh, uh, the economy goes into a drought. Uh, and and that's what happened. So we fell to 6.1 percent uh, in uh, 2018, 19, then to 4.2 percent in 1920. So you, you see the lag defect. This is really, in a way, the lag defect of of what had happened uh, during this second term of the UPA, uh, uh, with the caveat that the this damage could have been contained a little bit at least if the Modi government had also acted on recapitalization of the banks a little faster and cleaning up of the NPAs a little faster. Uh, some of this could have been contained with that caveat. But the point is that a lot of reforms that I have just mentioned to you uh, have been done in the last four or five years. The impact is about is still to, you know, some impact we have already begun to feel, but not uh, most of it is to come. So I think, you know, there is every good reason to be to be optimistic. I think uh, these five minutes have been really the most educative. You so beautifully traced the history of, you know, the last 20, 25 years so effortlessly. I, I'm not sure if students even understood what hit them, but I'm sure they're going to internalize this for a long time. They're going to keep thinking and recalling some of these nuggets that you shared. Uh, so we have, uh, this is a very special lecture. We have named it as the last lecture because our uh, senior batch the outgoing batch, this will be the last lecture that they will listen to. So some of them have some very interesting questions for you. Uh, so there's one question. Um, naturally, students look at you as somebody who's highly accomplished in your career, who's who's probably, you know, I think um, after a certain point in time, they have been only milestones. So they have a very interesting question. They're asking, when did you first sense your big win in your career? So this is a question. <laughs> no, no, no. There are no, you know, first big win that I sensed was uh, uh, when uh, in, in my, uh, 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 you know, at that time we did uh, after high school, after tenth class, you you used to do pre-university. Uh, uh, this was the first year in 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 a, in a college, uh, and then there was a three-year degree program which led led, led to BA. So well, my first one was. Uh, because my father had me change from science to arts because he thought I should do IAS. And, and uh, 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 if you were in science, then you don't get enough papers actually in the IAS in those days. Things have changed now. Uh, so, so he said you need history uh, down the road because you can have two, two lower, lower level and one higher level uh, paper in history. <laughs> so that was his planning. Uh, so anyway, he uh, forced me. Uh, I, I was not very happy because you know the, there is always this uh, stigma attached when you go to college. Kya science chhod de iska matlab chali nahi science, you know. So arts mein aage. So but anyway, I topped in my pre-university. That was my first big win. So I mean, you know, uh, this is all evolves. So th th that's where I I thought you know then um, uh, in in terms of. Uh, uh, serious milestones. I think you know, getting into Princeton was completely, uh, at least retrospectively, at that time probably I did not realize what had happened to me. Uh, but getting to Prince into Princeton because you know, from Rajasthan University to, I mean, as I said, I still cannot explain back why, why I, I mean, I had a fantastic you know career at Rajasthan University, but that was a Rajasthan University. Who knows about it? Nobody you know outside at Princeton. Who has any reason to know anything about Rajasthan University? And I also, you know, did I was not serious. 
so i never took the gre uh, because you know the plan was that i'll do sit for the ias you know so uh, uh, the next year i was a lecturer uh, and and so i said look you know uh, gres are not administered in my hometown and going to delhi is a bit of a uh, problem in, in, in here and so forth so i never took gres either so what did princeton take what did you know what made princeton i mean i got admitted so i probably had the record for it but to get fellowship was was quite a big deal so so i would say that uh, was was clearly a very important uh, uh, turning point uh, uh, beyond that you know uh, ultimately for the academics it's it's a very piecemeal process the first paper that got accepted in a professional journal i thought you know personally i mean that was a very satisfying thing to do that you know in a major journal uh, as a, a, a paper that you wrote got accepted that you know for an uh, because you know in the us universities we are hardwired to really succeed academically so you know if if i had even uh, the, even there is some pressure that you know take an academic job not you know so if i chose uh, to go to academic uh, position rather than the world bank uh, it it was to substantial degree driven by this hard wiring that that the university uh, professors do for you uh, 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 um, uh, you know so uh getting a paper first time accepted in a major journal uh, uh that was a truly a big deal uh, so so those are the things personally you know uh, but ultimately uh, the, the process as i said you know for the academics is piecemeal uh uh, uh no you know uh, 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 other things i think you know it's all retrospective because uh, obviously the book i did india the emerging giant eventually proved to be very important as well uh, at the time i had not realized uh, but you know it still remains uh, uh, probably the only work of its kind uh, today i mean i spent quite a few years writing that work and all but you know you never realize you don't uh, you know these things you don't anticipate initially that whether they will be a success or they will not be a success um, so so those are things uh, niti ayog was obviously a very important uh, milestone i think that was became the most important milestone obviously uh, uh, i mean in terms of wider recognition uh, by by the uh, uh, people you know at, at large not also outside your profession so you know the uh, unlike in the lives of politicians and others for for academics the, the process tends to be a bit more piecemeal i mean only you can appreciate that i uh, this was a very important thing and and mostly retrospectively prospectively i have given you the moments you know the where i sort of felt wow you know so when i stopped the entire university in pre university that was a really to me uh, first major thing to have happened uh, uh, not of much significance i should say in the longer run uh, uh and uh, uh, uh you know likewise the first paper getting published not of a big significance but you know for personal satisfaction that was absolutely a very thrilling moment uh, i think uh, i'm sure the students would love all the you know the kind of highs in your career and it's so worthy of emulation they want to really today i mean especially the students who are just going to step into their careers they want to take a lot of inspiration i think we rightly named this the last lecture they want to really take a lot of inspiration we have a question um from our uh, member board of governors mr atul um what is your opinion especially you know in the context of the united states um the 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 world order especially um how are they looking at this atmanirbhar how do they view this atmanirbhar bharat uh no, i mean i don't see that there is a big view out here on atmanirbhar bharat uh, because you know uh, they i, I mean uh, our trade policies are sort of well established uh and uh, whereas internally we have a lot of debate about you know what the prime minister means by atmanirbhar bharat and and then there are others who start interpreting it as you know so, so some sort of uh, uh mandate for uh, 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 increasing protection against imports which to me is i don't think that's what the prime minister really means by it and anyway india's tariffs had begun to rise well before prime minister gave that speech on atmanirbhar bharat the very first one um, you know which which was i think what may 
or, or 2020. Um, so uh, I, I don't think the, the Americans take a view on this uh, one or the other way. Uh, 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 you know, they, they uh, see their relationship with India more in terms of trade policy of India and where the, the, where the barriers are to their own exports to India. I think that's the way they say, and, and in that sense, I think not a whole lot has changed uh, from their point of view. They, I mean, their the, the view, uh, if anything, actually, in some of the areas, it has improved, right? On insurance sector, for example, uh, before Prime Minister Modi came in 2014, there had been a long-standing demand of the U.S. insurance industry to raise that foreign investment limit from 26 percent at that time to 49. But not only Prime Minister Modi raised it to 49, but it's not raised it to 74. Uh, so from uh, at least that one important and, and politically powerful industry, uh, uh, the, India has moved in the correct direction from their viewpoint. It has not gone into, into self-sufficiency mode. Uh, so, so I don't think on, on Atmanirbha Bharat as such, they, they, they take a big view. They, it, it, it may be the businessmen feel a little more cautious that, you know, is this going to translate into uh, and, and but but that sort of is more. I think that 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 fear is coming more from the increases in tariffs that have already happened, and and some of this talk of the import substitution by both some of the other cabinet members and the bureaucrats. Uh, you know, uh, not by prime minister. I think prime minister. I've never heard him say, Ki, you know, we we want to. He wants domestic production to rise. He wants domestic industry to be vibrant. Uh, and he talks about local for global and so forth. Uh, uh, I've never heard, I mean, I can't think of any single speech of prime minister himself, you know, interprets Atmanirbha Bharat in the way some others in our country seem, seem, seem to do. So. So our actions, you are saying, are speaking louder than maybe the slogan. So yeah, and they will have to speak louder, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what we do. So, so as I said, American businessmen probably get a little worried more, a bit more worried. I should say. I mean, policymakers have have a different agenda, meaning that they want opening up regardless of whatever you know political uh, 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 speak is. Political speak is often they know that you know political speak has to be often for the domestic uh, political constituencies. So, so, so at, at the policy level, what they would want is, you know, what is India willing to do in terms of opening up the markets for the U.S. products? Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the uh, businessmen, I think, get a little concerned that, you know, this this raising of tariffs might, uh, you know, impact, uh, uh, might might uh, um, impact their interests adversely down the road. Uh, but that's about it. But I think it's in the end, yeah. I think in the end, it's the actions, what we do. Right. So I still have a list of maybe unending list of questions, actually. I'm getting bombarded with more and more. Time is a cruel thing. It's it's really, yes. I mean, it's it's been an exciting discussion, conversation, really enriching and humbling all at the same time. You know, hearing from somebody like you, um, I think a thousand books cannot give us this kind of wisdom. So, so packed, uh, so powerful. Um, we are very thankful. I think now I'll have to give it back to Pratik, though I would like that this conversation goes on and on, unfortunately. So I request Pratik to take back. Well, thank you. I think you conducted it very, very well. So I appreciate it. Sure. Uh, thank you, ma'am. As you rightly said, it was indeed an enriching experience listening to Dr. Panagriya sir's life journey and what drives him as a person. Thank you, sir, for your uh, insightful answers and perspectives to some interesting questions from our students. Uh, we are indeed privileged to uh, listen to your words of wisdom today. And I'm sure that all the students are very grateful for the same. I would uh, also like to thank Professor K. Sanjini Ma'am for seamlessly moderating the question and answer session. Uh, now we move on to uh, our uh, respected uh, director, sir, uh, who, who would, uh, would share some kind words. Sir, uh, we have no words to express our gratitude towards you for accepting invitation and given such a scholarly 
answers on many of the questions as well as practical viewpoint, government stand, and some of the confusion that people might have about uh, the very articulating policy of Atnirbhar Bharat. Sir, we are also trying our best to have a global footprint on the logistics and supply chain, particularly operations management side in NITI. And uh, we are having uh, a global course which is attended by more than 2,500 participants, including uh, it is taught by Professor David Simchi Levy of MIT, actually, sir, well known uh, as management, management science editor in chief, sir. He is actually one of the uh, key speaker of that course. So we are trying to bring a lot of uh, new professionals in the field of logistics by inviting them to attend that kind of lectures. And with your yes. presence, sir, we are so excited uh, that uh, not, not many words are coming to say. So therefore, it is better, sir, to listen to you than to say so many things. So <laughs> from our side, from all of my NITI community, faculty members, everybody, it's a big namaskar to you, sir. Pranam. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. For blessing always, sir, and whenever uh, we need, I think we can approach you for guidance and suggestions. Okay. Sir. Good. Good. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, sir, uh, can we please have five minutes of your time uh, before we close the session? I think. So.